Faith matters. An interactive program brought to you by MTA International. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Faith Matters, where you, our audience, set the agenda by the questions you ask. Thank you to all of those who have already sent us in your questions. But for those of you joining us for the first time or as yet unfamiliar with what to do, it's an easy one. Send us an email to faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. You can also find us on YouTube for programs that have previously been recorded. Simply go to YouTube, type in MTA Online 1, Faith Matters, the name of the program, the question that you have, and hopefully you should find your answer there. And if not, you know what to do, email us at faithmatters at mta.tv. In this age of social media that we are all living in, you can also follow us on Twitter on hashtag MTA Faith Matters for any comments, thoughts, observations, or what you hear about today, or indeed questions of your own. You know what to do. And with that brief introduction, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to Faith Matters three established scholars within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Gentlemen, welcome back to Faith Matters. Assalamu alaikum. In terms of a brief introduction, to my immediate right is Mulana Abdul Ghani Jahangir Sahib, senior missionary and head of the Central Desk for French speaking countries. Welcome, Jahangir Sahib. To his right is Mulana Qasid Moin Sahib. He is a missionary here in the UK and is also part of the Ahmadiyya Archive and Research Center here in the UK. Qasid Sahib, welcome back. Thank you very much. To his right is Dr. Zahid Ahmed Khan Sahib, who is president of the Qazar Board, the Board of Jurisprudence here in the United Kingdom for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Welcome, Dr. Sahib. Jazakallah. Gentlemen, we're going to start by traveling to the USA for our first question. And we have a question from Naman Anjum Sahib. Naman Sahib, thank you very much for your question. He relates that a friend of his, a non-Muslim friend of his, has given him some uh, links about there being a sixth pillar of Islam. And uh, he suggests that this sixth pillar, as they suggest it's jihad, isn't mentioned so much because it's politically incorrect. Uh, Dr. Saab, if I can come to you with this one first. Uh, he says, when I searched the net, I actually found some sites which does claim this. And uh, he's asking if we can shed some light uh, on this matter. That, that is right. There are a minority of Sunni sects who actually claim that there are six pillars of Islam rather than five. Uh, but when we go to the source of guidance for Islam, the Holy Quran and the Hadith of the Holy Prophet wasallam, in fact, there are a large number of uh, traditions of the Prophet wasallam in different circumstances where he has talked about the pillars of Islam and number five has been mentioned. In fact, one of the Hadith which many actually scholars consider to be one of the greatest uh, hadith is a tradition where the Prophet wasallam was sitting with his companions uh, around him and a man shabbily dressed, dusty clothes came, came into him, sat very next, next door to the Prophet wasallam, and began to what seemed to be questioning him impertinently as to what is faith, what is Islam, what is Islam, you know? And the companions were taken aback by the surroundings of this. And the Prophet answered each, que each question and the man would say, yes, that is correct. And when he asked about what is Islam, the Prophet actually gave the five pillars of Islam, the uh, proclamation that there is no God but Allah, uh, and to say the prayers perfectly, to fast in the month of Ramadan, to pay the zakat, and to perform the pilgrimage to the house of Allah. So these are five pillars of Islam that the Prophet wasallam gave at that time. The man then left and uh, the companions were astounded and this, uh, the Prophet said, do you know who that was? And the companion said, no, Prophet of Allah, who was that? And he said that was Jibrail, Gabriel, the angel, who had come to question me about faith and these were the answers that I had given him. So from this very important hadith, one is able to understand that there were five pillars of Islam that the Prophet talked about. Hazrat Umar had reported this, it's in Bukhari and in Muslim, the true gate books of, of Hadith. On another occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu has said that Islam is like a building. It is built on five pillars, and these are the five pillars. But he has said that jihad is the highest point of your, of your faith. It is, 
It is like the pinnacle of your faith. And when we actually understand what he means by jihad, then we are able to understand that jihad is something that is extremely important in our, in our lives. It is the self-reformation of our bodies, of ourselves, that we have to live our lives according to those five pillars of Islam. So you know, jihad as, as such encompasses all of our actions in that respect, that we have to build a close relationship with God Almighty through self-reformation, and that is a very important aspect of our life. <coughs> it is not a pillar of Islam, but it is nonetheless an important aspect of how we, how we live our life. The other important thing that comes to my mind is that as far as jihad, the lesser jihad that is, that is holy war, translated as holy war sometimes, defensive holy war, that will be abolished. None of the five pillars of Islam will ever be abolished in our lives. However, jihad, according to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu himself has said, that when the Masih comes, then jihad will be abolished, meaning that particular jihad. So if it was a pillar of Islam, then it would not have been abolished in any circumstance as such. So therefore, we must understand from this angle as well, that jihad is not a pillar of Islam. The pillars of Islam are those five that are given by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is what uh, uh, we find from the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And just, Jazakumullah, uh, Dr. Saab, I hope that answers your question, uh, Naman Saab. And of course, if it doesn't, you know what to do. But I just wanted to reflect on this a little bit further and for the sake of those uh, who don't know what jihad actually means, um, Qasid Saab, if I could just ask you uh, very quickly in almost uh, to explain it to a child or in layman's terms, as someone might say, you know, very simply, what actually is jihad? Well, jihad, it is uh, basically comes from the word jihada in Arabic, mm -hmm. which literally means that he struggled and he strived for a specific purpose. Now there was a time, uh, like Dr. Sub, you know, alluded, alluded to briefly, that there was a time in the early Islam when Muslims were being attacked viciously, vehemently, and they were persecuted, they were driven out of their homes, and they were followed and continuously attacked despite this. After that, there was an instruction that you may defend yourself. And that defense was then, you know, the term of jihad was coined with that defense, which the Muslims took up. However, jihad constantly and continuously, jihad has always meant something which you str struggle with, which you strive with. And as, as Dr. Saab has said, that jihad also encompasses the meaning of physical or <coughs> spiritual um, uh, rectifying or you know, perfecting yourself or bettering yourself in terms of morals, in terms of um, values. And this is something which the Promised Messiah, Islam, when he came, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib in 1889, and when he announced the you know, community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, this was one of those things which was very unique about Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib, Islam, that he introduced this meaning of jihad to mean you know, the struggle or to strive for your betterment, for your own well-being. Whereas the entire, almost the entire Muslim Ummah considered it to mean holy war to defend oneself against any onslaughts, wherever you are. If it's a Muslim being attacked, then you must attack back. Mm -hmm. So it was all being sort of, it was all confused and it was all, you know, uh, uh, th there was a great mis uh, misconception and confusion about this. But the Promised Messiah, Islam, he came, he told this to people. He is, he's written a book and, you know, the, the, the question and the viewers can go back and read this book. It's called The British Government and Jihad. In various other books as well, he's <clears throat> alluded to this concept of jihad, the bettering of oneself. So it's about At struggling, it's about having a, a strife and <coughs> achieving. Exactly. It, it almost feels like actually the five pillars of Islam have an element to that already in themselves. So rather than jihad being a pillar in itself, it's actually... Which is what Dr. Zahid Khan Saab was saying, right. that actually to be able to put all these things into practice, you have to, make, you have to struggle with yourself. Yeah. And that is jihad. But I did need to uh, just point out in case somebody might misunderstand what Dr. Saab had said in the beginning. When Dr. Saab said that uh, the, the promised Messiah was supposed to come to abolish jihad, that does not mean abolish it p completely. It means to put it into abeyan abeyance. But the word which he used was ultuwa, which means it's been, it's, put, uh, it's been held back. And because when he was uh, to come, Islam was not to be attacked by the sword. And he said that actually they are attacking Islam these days by the pen. And therefore we have to respond in kind. And he said, how can 
uh, people believe that Jesus is going to come, the Messiah is going to come, and is going to abolish completely one of the um, uh, rules which is in the Quran. This is impossible. But he said, but it can be put on hold depending on the kind of attack which is being launched against the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And in these days, as we know, even today, Islam as such as a religion is not attacked by weapons. Nobody is out there to try and completely destroy the religion of Islam by weapons. But what they are doing is they are trying to destroy the, the, the ideas of Islam. And they use social media, they use you know, the printed media, etc. Um, to, or television, radio, to do that. And so therefore we are responding in kind. And this kind of jihad is still very much being used. But, the, but jihad with weapons has been put into abeyance. And that means that because it's not required now, because Muslims are not being attacked so that Islam could be destroyed, Muslims have no right to start fighting left, right and center. You know, saying that they think that Islam is being destroyed, it's not. You know, so this is, the this is a sign of the times which shows that um, the, the promised Messiah was supposed to come. Mm. Whenever you see this situation appear, I'm saying this for the benefit of the Muslims who are watching us out there, they should know that the Messiah's time has arrived. Mm. When there is no holy war, mm. so said, you know, uh, so-called ho holy war, mm. uh, which is required of, of, of the Muslims at all. Just one point I wanted to mention mm -hmm. here, um, alluding to, you know, the initial Please question. This point needs to be uh, borne in mind that initially Shiaism, the, it's an offshoot of you know the mainstream uh, Islam. They included jihad as one of their pillars or one of their branches, which literally you know they call it furu the branches of their belief or the branches of their uh, faith. So an but even almost. It, it was. I mean, Shiaism had different sort of. Um, um, oh, uh, they had a different sort. Exactly. I mean, they had different sort of. Um, I don't want to say agendas, but they had uh, different, slightly different perceptions, um, perceptions mm. or uh, interests, okay. or their you know pr preferences. And the uh, Shiism included this, like I said, in their Furuddin, their branches of religion. But even now, today, jihad is it, it is exactly what the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat has reintroduced to the world, and that is the bettering of oneself, the, the, uh, the jihad the akbar, the greatest jihad, and that is to perfect yourself for the betterment of society at large and to be a better uh, member of society for the whole of humanity, uh, ultimately. Jazakum la gentlemen, I think we have perfectly answered that question and of course please do let us know your comments or further questions if you have them. We're going to move slightly further north uh, to Canada uh, to Tanvir Saab, Tanvir Ahmed Saab who writes in Jazakum Allah for your very kind comments. He asks about resolving conflicts and war and what could be the role of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in, uh, in doing so. Jangir um, Saab. Well, you see, what we're doing in the world and since our, in our very inception is that we are trying to correct man, mankind, from within. Because what you see on the world uh, field for example, at the United Nations or when nations meet, when people talk to each other, when they come on the television, etc. What you see political leaders saying is that they're all for peace. Mm. That the, their whole discourse is about, we love peace, we want peace, we're mm. going to do everything to establish peace, establish human rights and all that, you know. So it all sounds very nice. But whenever their national interests are at stake, then you see the real sentiments coming to the fore. And then you can see when they're, when they're tested, whether war and warfare comes up, out of their, boils out of their hearts, mm -hmm. or is it real peace as they were t talking about previously. Unfortunately, these days, this is what we see. And it's not only in the political, uh, on the political level, it's also in the religious world as well. We'll see, for example, religious leaders who, who really don't care how immoral their followers are becoming. They really, they couldn't care less. And so they'll allow them to become really, you know, criminal. They're not following their faith at all. And they don't really, uh, they sleep, you know, uh, as they used to sleep before. That doesn't bother them at all. But if they see that one of their followers has been taken over by another religion, 
you know, some other religion which is out there, you know, preaching and they've managed to convert them into their fold, then you see them rising up and uh, creating mayhem and asking their followers to go and kill those people. You see, then you see that those people too, those religious leaders too, and this goes across the board, whether it's in the Islamic world or the Buddhist world or the Hindu world, the Christian world, Jewish world, we'll see there are those religious leaders who are like that, who are out there, and they have uh, warfare within them. So it means that the real problem is what's in their hearts. Now, it, when people try to solve conflicts in the world, what they do is they work, they work on the surface level. They try to, you know, the, to use means and methods which only are on the top of the thing. Mm. They don't go down to the root cause. They don't try to change the people from within. Mm. But the real revolution can only happen and the real peace that we want, all want, can only come about if that is sorted out first. And this is why you'll see that from its very inception, the Ahmadiyya movement, which is the renaissance of true Islam, has been dealing with that aspect. Mm -hmm. So everywhere we go, we're telling people, you have to come back to godliness. You have to come back to goodness. You have to come back to justice. You have to come back to unselfishness. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've sorted those things out, then you will not allow yourself to become a warmongering person. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a leader, all the better, because then it will not affect other people either. Mm. So this is what the, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been doing. And fearlessly, I've seen, for example, in certain areas where, you know, there are countries which are uh, ruled by people who are, I wouldn't say tyrannical, but who are, you know, who have a very strong grip on their nation. Mm. And sometimes Ahmadis are, are, have to address these people. And I've seen the leaders of our communities, the Amirs of our communities, address them and tell them where they're going wrong. Mm. And you could imagine that these people could take it very unkindly, but often they, they don't really mind because they can see that these people are very sincere. And this is because Ahmadis are people who are sincere. When you become an Ahmadi, you become an Ahmadi at, at, you know, uh, at the price of, of great sacrifices. Often people in your family will abandon you. You might be kicked out of your job you might lose so many things. So Ahmadis, if they become, people have become Ahmadis, they've been tested and they've been tried. Their metal has been put to the test and they've proven themselves to be sincere. And so when a person is sincere, others can also feel this, you see. So Ahmadis are out there talking to the leaders and telling them things fearlessly. And we've seen the best case of that, of, out of all, is that of our own Caliph. May Allah strengthen his hand. He's been out there, he's addressed parliaments, he's addressed the greatest leaders on, on the planet, fearlessly. And he's told them where they're going wrong. And some, sometimes you'll see great politicians sitting there like little children yeah. in a classroom, listening to the Khalifa, you know, giving them a lecture. And then saying that you're absolutely correct. A question you know? that springs to my mind, Jazakumullah Jangi Saab. Um, I hope that answers your question, Tanvi Saab. Uh, just a question following on from that, um, Qasid Saab, I suppose, what I'd like to ask is, what can the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community individually do? We've heard some brilliant examples of what the leaders are doing, and of course our own Khalifa is setting the best example. But what can practically be done by just everyday people, and even members of the public who are not part of the community? You know, what, what, how can we get involved to resolve conflicts of war? Well, in fact, the, the solution to that is in that very question that, you know, individuals, it is the individuals that can actually bring about change. It's not a certain political party or it's not representatives. It's everyone in totality. It's the individual from within that can actually do something. For instance, I'll give you the example. The Holy Prophet wasallam once said in a hadith, and this is what Ahmadis live by and what we try to promote. The Holy Prophet said, La yu'minu ahadukum. Uh, that none of you can be a true believer until he loves for his brother what he likes for himself. Mm. When you're putting your brother first, when you're putting the other individual first, before yourself, because what this in actuality is saying that don't look for your own rights, look for the rights of your brother, find the rights of your brother, and in doing so, he will also look for the rights for your you know, own self. Mm. When there's this harmonious sort of lifestyle, or where this this harmonious um, environment where everyone is looking after the rights of others instead of fighting for the rights of their own selves. That's the ideal situation, although it seems very you know, utopian, but 
it is possible. The MDM Muslim Jamaat by the sheer grace and blessings of Allah, it does live by this. It has been doing so for the last 127 years and it will, inshallah, God willing, continue to do so. Inshallah. And this is what it, you know, if, if someone, I'll give you the example of a person who, you know, living in his house, he doesn't have his house under control. You know, his children are a mess, his wife, he, you know, he, he constantly quarrels with his wife. But he goes across the road and knocks on the other person's door and says, you know, you're not, and if, he, if he's in the same sort of situation and he tells him to admonish his wife and admonish his children that you're not, you know, looking after your house properly, that person will say, well, go and take, you know, go and look after your home first and then be in a position to tell me what to do. That is exactly Charity what is, at home, exactly, yeah, that, that, that is what, <clears throat> what in essence is the interpretation of this hadith. That charity begins at home. Until you don't perfect yourself or the perfect your own sort of, you know, responsibility, the people who are under you and who are in your responsibility, until you haven't done that, you, are, you cannot or you should not be in a position to go and tell other people that you are wrong or you uh, should perfect yourself first. And that fits in quite perfectly, as some of our audience will know, to the Friday sermons that have been delivered by our Khalifa recently, he's continually reminding us to reflect on our own actions first exactly. before looking at helping others, although both are very important. Absolutely, I mean double standards is something that Takasid has uh, alluded to and mm. this is what we find in world conflicts that world political powers have got double standards when it comes to dealing with different nations. And this is the thing that is that, as Jahangir Sabha said, is at the root of the problem and that is what has got to be sorted out. So that is what our aim is, to make sure that the world becomes a more just place so that these double standards do not exist. And they have to be from grassroots up throughout all societies, throughout nations, throughout international borders so that this can be achieved. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community holds a unique position, as my two colleagues have said, that we are worldwide we have no political or geographical ambitions to gain, to gain land. And we have one leader who speaks with a, a divinely appointed voice and the whole nation lis listens to him. So our CV is great. The whole world, in fact. The whole world listen, listens to him, as mm -hmm. said. So our CV is great and that is why we have a pivotal role in establishing world peace. And that is what the efforts of our leader, uh, His Holiness, the Khalifa al Masih, has been and may Allah continue to strengthen his hands so that mm -hmm. we continue to see the success of world peace and success of Islam and Ahmadiyyat in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, Jazakumullah for another very detailed and comprehensive answer. Tamid Saab, I have doubt that there is anything left unanswered, but of course, if there is, you know what to do. It's faithmatters at mta.tv. We're going to move on and in a slightly more positive tone, we're going to look at a question from Germany. Khurram Khansab writes in, and thank you very much, Khurram Saab, for your kind comments. He mentions that he's noticed, particularly in Faith Matters, that the questions are answered with backgrounds from the Quran linking to the Hadith and the, the very cause of Islam. He's asking, what principles are laid down by Islam for establishing world peace? It's, I mean, since the time of the Holy Prophet wasallam, up until now, you know, Islam's teachings have always been about world peace. It's, it, you know, it's a big claim, but if you read the Holy Quran in a very impartial manner, the Holy Quran does inculcate world peace uh, for the whole of mankind, for every individual, and like we've been discussing in the previous question, you know, from an individual level outwards to the, you know, the, the greater unit, the family unit, the, you know, your neighborhood, the country, and worldwide. Islam is always about peace. The Holy Prophet wasallam, his life was about peace, his mission was peace. The very name Islam means peace. You know, Islam comes from Salama, which means peace, submission, obedience. Now, the Holy Prophet wasallam, if we take his example, it was such and we've been talking about, you know, the early uh, times. When, the, when Muslims were being persecuted and at a time, you know, we've been discussing this, they were being put in a very difficult situation. The companions would constantly say to the Prophet that, O oh, Prophet of Allah, please allow us to defend ourselves. But the Holy Prophet ﷺ would say one thing, that inni umirtu bil afwe falatu qatilu, that I have been commissioned with forgiveness. I have been commissioned to forgive, so you may not fight. 
This was before permission was granted to defend yourself. If we see this entirely, the, you know, this sums up the Holy Prophet and his life, and you read biographies, Orientalists have accepted the fact that if they are impartial also, I mean, they will raise allegations against the fights, and that's something, you know, constantly we are um, addressing, and we're trying to put it, you know, in, into perspective um, of the actuality of that uh, scenario. But in totality, the Orientalists will also be able to tell you that Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was a very peaceful person. He, from within, he wanted to bring about peace, and he used various methods. So, just to interject on that, so would you say then that forgiveness takes precedent over self-defense? That question is the crux of basically, you know, this this issue. And I would say that. If you are to forgive, then you have to be able, you have to be alive, basically. You know, you have to be living to be able to forgive. So and for that, easier, so to. so they both go hand in hand. You know, if if someone is about to strike you and end your life before you're given the chance to forgive him, then you know you have to be alive to, to be in, in that position to forgive someone. Mm -hmm. So that that is a very you know that is the pertinent matter. But the issue I want to come to is the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Initially, I mean, because he was the founder of Islam, the Holy Quran, you know, it clearly in one verse. It also describes his life and how it was. It says, That will you grieve yourself to death because they do not believe. This was the, the situation the Holy Prophet was constantly in. He was always in prayer and supplication for the world to understand what Islam is truly about because he knew and realized that Islam is that one means through which the world can come to world peace. The world can come to, you know, from that time up until now. Unfortunately, we have seen great um, distress, a lot of you know, turmoil in the world. People have been killing one another through, for, for petty issues. You know? We've seen two world wars, we've seen the civil war, uh, the, you know, cold wars, civil wars. Today, we see you know, uh, great unrest in the world. But constantly, from that time up until now, you know, we see Hazrat Khalifa al Masih. He is addressing, like Jahangir Sab uh, earlier in the program, he addressed that. He's addressing parliaments. He appoints his emirs, his you know, national presidents or his people from around the world to go to certain events, to go to certain functions and to tell the people explicitly what Islam is about and what people are doing wrong. Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih, in fact, you know, regarding world peace, he delivered an address. And this will be interesting for you know, the questioner to go back and look into. On the 11th of May 2013 in uh, California in the United States, he had the, the topic of his address was, in fact, the, Islam, the Islamic solution for world peace. And in that, Hazur, um, His Holiness, may Allah strengthen his hand, he spoke about the first verse of the Holy Quran, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, that all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. And in this, he alluded to that, you know, it is not the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, the God of the Muslims, or the God of America or a certain geographical place, but it is the God of all people, all the whole universe. The, the Hazur said that when I ponder over this verse, and he said this about himself, he said, when I ponder over this word, verse, I cannot think of expressing ill will or enmity against any nation. And he said this on various other occasions, that I cannot, it, it's not in me to have hatred or enmity towards a person. I can be upset about you know, a specific um, happening or a doing of a specific country, but at the end of the day, I cannot have enmity. I only have sympathy for my fellow beings. And this is what Islam you know, um, encourages, that until this feeling is in your heart, that you have that hu humanity, in essence, that sympathy for your fellow beings, you cannot bring about world peace. And this is ultimately what Islam is all about, having that sympathy and that empathy for your fellow beings around the world, whoever they are. Jazakumullah Qasid Saab for that and Jazakumullah Khurim Saab for your question. I hope that does answer the question that you had. We move on across the pond again now to Samir Iqbal from USA. Samir Saab, thank you very much for your question. He writes in and asks about the indications in the Holy Quran for nuclear war or widespread destruction or uh, when that may be. Dr. Saab, do we know anything about <coughs> nuclear war in the Quran? This is the marvels of the Holy Quran, the predictions, the prophecies contained 1400 years ago when man had no inkling as to what 
how the world was created, what the Big Bang was. The Holy Quran speaks of these at a time when obviously Hubble was not around, we didn't know, so the black hole theory, the Big Bang, that is all in the Holy Quran, as is, you'd be surprised, uh, the concept of the atom uh, is a chapter of the Holy Quran in which this is specifically mentioned that the a smallest particle, the energy that it contains and the destruction that it brings about is phenomenal. And the Holy Quran has predicted that, that the time will come when this will be the type of destruction that man will uh, lay himself bare to. So the Holy Quran definitely speaks of that. The chapter is uh, Surah uh, al hamaza um, 104, I believe. I, I don't have the reference it here, is, but yes. yeah. yeah, perhaps Jangi Sab can uh, allude to that further. I'm sure. Well, I, uh, I, yeah. have, I happen to have the the verses oh, with me here Allah. just by chance. <laughs> um, so the, this whole surah is a very small surah, very small chapter. It's, it talks about um, people who, in, at a certain point, will be those who amass wealth. So they'll be wealthy. They'll be wealthy nations, basically. But there'll also be people who will be backbiting and slandering. And I think the reference here is to slandering Islam. They will be slandering the religion of truth. That will be one of their mainstays, always, always attacking Islam for any reason. And they will think that they are going to remain forever, that they're going to, their wealth will make them immortal, you see. So Allah says in this, uh, in this surah, I'm just going to read through quickly to the translation. Uh, so Allah says, Woe to every backbiter, slanderer, who amasses wealth and counts it time after time. He thinks that his wealth will make him immortal. Nay, he shall surely be cast into the crushing punishment. Now this is what uh, Dr. Zaid Khan was alluding to. Kalla la yunbadhanna fil hutama. Al hutama, hutama in Arabic, means something which is, uh, can be something which is crushing you, but it can also mean the finest particle which is left. And so, this is actually the, the atom. It is the tiniest particle in the, in, in the Arabic language. You can't express it in, in another way. It is this. It's the hutama. And this is exactly the, um, what we're talking about. Nuclear warfare is using the power. It's unleashing the power of the atom from within. Now Allah says, and what should make thee know what this hutama is? So he says it's Allah's kindled fire. It's like a fire which has been kindled, but it, it hasn't been unleashed yet, but it's there, it's been kindled. And the funny thing, or the amazing thing I should say, which uh, again, which Dr. Saab had uh, mentioned, which, you know, which is one of the features of the Quran, it mentions things far in advance before they're discovered by man. And later discoveries always confirm that the Quran was correct. Now Allah says that this is a fire which reaches the hearts. Now, it means that it has the power to actually reach the hearts of men. Now, what's known of nuclear explosions is that those who are within the shock zone will die, not because of the fire coming out of it, but because of that shock wave, which will actually stop their hearts from beating. So their, their hearts will stop beating because of that shock, and this will kill them. So this is a, a different kind of fire. It's not one that you will regularly see, obviously. Now Allah says it will be closed in upon them. So it means that it's a kind of an enclosed fire, but also that it will surround them, depending on which angle you're looking at it from. Fi amadim mumaddada, which means it will be in the form of extended columns. Now this can mean two things. Either that the, the, this uh, you know, terrible energy source will be enclosed in columns, which is also the case today, mm. or that the atom itself will become like a column. And this is also the case, because when the atom is about to explode, it actually extends out into a, a longish shape, you know, from the pressure inside, and then it's, it releases its energy. And that's what the explosion comes from. So this is an amazing surah. For have, I have to remind the viewers who may not be aware of this, because not everybody knows everything about Islam. This was revealed to a person who was an unlettered man in uh, 6th or 7th century Arabia, in the middle of a desert, who hadn't seen a bicycle. And yet he's speaking about these things, about the power of the atom, how it's enclosed in columns, how it reaches the heart, you know, all these extremely amazing things. So it means that there is this here, and it will be 
a punishment for those who thought that their wealth was everything, their wealth would make them immortal, and they could, get a, get, they could you know, escape any kind of punishment even though they will continuously backbite and slander Islam. Well, Allah says, well, think again. You see, I have my kindled fire and this is going to you know, uh, turn back. Uh, but the, the poetic justice which is being done here, the, uh, the irony of the whole thing, is that they themselves have made it. You see, they themselves have, have made this fire to use on others. But Allah is telling them here, beware, if you are going to continue behaving like this, it will be used against yourself. You, you will be the ones who will suffer from it. So this is a very great prophecy. And of course, there are other mentions in you know, other places where the, the nuclear war was mentioned in the Quran too. But this is uh, one of the main, the main ones. Just, and just to carry on the second part of his question there, he asks about there, if there is any indication of widespread destruction or, or any kind of uh, identification of to when that might be. <coughs> Sorry. Apart, uh, as, for the, as far as the widespread aspect of it is concerned, we can't really say. But what we can say is that Allah says in, a, in another verse which relates to this terrible event which is going to happen, which is one of the greatest events of humankind, of human history, which, which is why it's, it's, it's mentioned again and again, especially in the, the final surahs of the, the Qur'an. Allah says that the believers will not even hear the hiss of it, not even the hiss of that sound which comes out of uh, the, you know, these bombs from afar, which you can hear. They, that means that there will be some parts of the world which will be relatively untouched. They will be so far removed from all that that they won't even hear it. So that gives an indication that not all of humankind will be wiped out by nuclear warfare, but certainly those who indulged in this slandering, the backbiting, and who thought that their wealth will make them eternal. Those ones, whoever they are, they can recognize themselves if they're listening to us today. They will be the ones who have to be, on, you know, have to be very careful because this is meant for them. So this is uh, all I can say on this for the moment. Jazakumullah, yeah. gentlemen, again, for a very detailed and comprehensive answer. I hope that answers your question and Jazakumullah for it, uh, Samir Saab. We move on uh, back to Germany. This time the question is from Arsalan Mahmoud Saab. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for your question. Uh, and indeed for your very kind comments uh, about the program. It's very much related, Jahangir Saab, to what you, we've been talking about uh, and to what we've mentioned about nuclear war and widespread destruction. Uh, Qasid Saab, if I can come to you with this one, he's asking about whether there'll be a third world war. Uh, and again, if so, when it will occur? Well, as far as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is concerned, we, um, you know, we follow what Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, uh, um, you know, in accordance with how he guides us. And as far as Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, the supreme head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, is concerned, he continuously tells us that the World War III, the Third World <coughs> War, it's pretty much, you know, it's it's in, it's active right now. As as we see, it started. You know, we see countries attacking other countries, vested interests. We see people usurping the rights of you know, others, unfortunately. Um, but continuously, you know, even in these circumstances, we see the Jamaat as a whole under its leader, the community under its leader, continue to you know, do what it does best, and that is advise people about you know, bring a, bringing about peace in the world and how to live as one you know, big family, uh, humanity, uh, ultimately. And this is another point that I wish to um, touch upon here, that although there is a third, world, a third world war and the likelihood of it being nuclear is very much high, however, you know, at, we're told that everyone is to die, everyone will perish, you know, everyone has an end. We all know that eventually everyone will die, but because of that we don't just sit idle and become dismayed because of that. We don't sit there and say, okay, let's not do anything then. You know, we know that there isn't going to be an end, but after that, obviously, there is going to be something else. Similarly, with the Third World War, what's been seen is that a lot of people, they become dismayed when they hear this, and especially when it comes, you know, when they hear about the nuclear war. Until Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih is constantly addressing the world and constantly admonishing them about peace, that is our stance, that is, that is what we will continue to do. 
And we should never become dismayed that we see, you know, well, what, the world war started. So because it started, it doesn't mean that we sit there and sit idly and completely become dismayed and disappointed, not do anything. We continue to do what we do, um, and we continue to um, carry on with our actual purpose. And it should not hinder us in our actual purpose, which is the, crea which is the worship of God and um, living in coexistence with our fellow beings in a harmonious environment. Actually, this has reminded mm. me that the world has been constantly telling us um, that, um, as Qasit Sahib has said, um, we don't know if this is going to become nuclear now. There is this prophecy in the Quran that there will be nuclear war, but however, we don't know whether this nuclear war is going to start in this present war or in another one, we don't know. But he said that we should, we should also try, while we're trying to maintain peace and call people back to peace and to justice, at the same time, we should also be fasting and we should also be offering charity to ward it off, to beg Allah to, you know, to draw Allah's mercy, to beg Allah to, to, you know, to postpone this as far as, as uh, is possible, so that we in our, our generation don't have to see this. Yeah. I remember Hazrat Khalifa Rabi rahimahullah, used to tell us many times, he said, all of you should pray that you do not see nuclear war because you will not be able to bear it. And he said this so many times that we actually started asking him, you know, that are we really going to see this? Mm -hmm. And if we don't see it, are our, our children not going to see it? And again, he answered, he said, well, maybe, you know, of course, some generation is going to see it, but you should pray that you don't see it because you will not be able to bear it. So it's a terrible, terrible thing. But it does not make us become dismayed, as Qasr Sabah has rightly said. We continue to call people to, to you know, to, to try and bring them back to the ways of peace mm -hmm. by dealing with their, in, their inner problems, the ruptures they have within, as we said previously, um, but also by, you know, these forms of worship which are tried and tested and which draw and do draw Allah's mercy, fast, fasting, prayer and, uh, and sacrifice, which is the, uh, by way of charity. So we do, you know, uh, tell people not to lose hope. They should also turn to God and they should also turn to these means to ward this terrible thing off. Yeah, the spiritual connection is that the Hazur constantly reminds the world that the world has forgotten its creator. And this is where the problem lies, that because of having forgotten the creator who has created all creation, this is the disassociation and all the problems that lead on from that. And he has been reminding the world that one must reconnect and establish its connection with its creator to have a bond with him. And that is the only, only way that the world will be saved from further calamities and destruction as such. Well, Jazakumullah, gentlemen, for that Sab, I hope that answers your question. We are optimistic that we're not going to see the end of the world, but we need to keep fasting and keep praying and with the grace of God we can avoid that. We're going to stay on a very similar theme. Uh, Jangi Sab, if I can come to you with this one. Uh, it's from right here in the UK. Rizwan Sab, Assalamu Alaikum, thank you for your question. Jangir Sab, he asks about the concept of Armageddon, um, what that's all about, and indeed, what does Islam say, and does Islam recognize it, especially with the reference to the end of times? This is very similar to what yes. we've been discussing. It's quite morbid today, isn't it? It is, yes. Nuclear war, world war, now Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well, the, I mean, this is a, a concept which is... Um, common to the Abrahamic faiths, but also, interestingly, to some of the, the Indian uh, uh, dharmas as well. They also mention things which relate to a massive destruction in the end, etc. Um, the word Armageddon itself uh, is said by some to be related to a, a kind of a, a hill or a small mountain in Israel called Tel Megiddo. And uh, this uh, is apparently the place where Gog and Magog are going to meet and they're going to clash and it will be the end because of them. Now, in Islam, we have something very similar which is mentioned. First of all, we see that, uh, as you might know, uh, words in Arabic have several meanings and there are, there are several layers of meanings within, you know, meanings within meanings in the Holy Quran. Now, one of the um, metaphors which is used which are used by um, uh, Allah in the Holy Quran is uh, the one of mountains. Now, when you, when you read about mountains, there are some verses which apparently talk about mountains as mountains themselves. I mean, it's pretty clear. 
but there are other references where you might think that something else is going on here. We have, for example, a verse, and this is in uh, chapter 38, verse 19. Allah says, speaking about Solomon, the Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him, Allah says, we subjected to him the mountains, al-jibal in Arabic. They celebrated God's praises with him at nightfall and sunrise. Now, obviously, mountains are not going to be celebrating God's praises in the way that we could understand it to be so. So here, it's the other meaning of jibal, which means great and powerful nations who are so great, they're like mountains. So at his, during his time, his reign, certain great peoples were, in effect, subjected to him. And this is what's being referred to here. Now, when we know this, suddenly we start understanding other verses which have to do with this. Now, there are so many verses on this subject. I've just taken a few. We have uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, which is chapter 18, verse 48, Allah says, And bethink of the day when we shall remove the mountains, or will make them move, and thou wilt see the nations of the earth march forward, forth against one another, or the earth is marching against each other, which means the nations of the earth. And we shall gather them together and, not, and shall not leave any one of them behind. So here Allah is talking about m mountains, which are powerful nations which, will, which shall be removed. And nations will come together, meaning it will be war. Again, Allah says, and they ask thee concerning the mountains. Now these again are the peoples, the great powerful nations, say, my Lord will break them into pieces and scatter them as dust. That was uh, chapter 20, verse 106. And in chapter 69, verse 15, we have, and, and this is a prophecy, and the earth and the mountains are heaved up and then crushed in a single crash. This is relating again to that nuclear warfare which we were talking about, where great uh, powers, two powers, will, world powers, will, will clash with, collide with each other and they will be crushed in a single crash, you see. Now this again links up with Gog and Magog. Who are Gog and Magog? We've, we've had que this question many times on Faith Matters, but very, very briefly. They are two blocks of related nations who are adept in the use of fire. So Allah has said that beware, beware that if, if nations can continue to pursue their national interests without thinking of other nations, if they continue to take the rights of other nations, you know, uh, in an unjust way, then this will happen. And they will meet at a place and they will destroy each other. So we can only pray once again that this does not happen. But our concept of Armageddon has nothing to do with the usual concept, which is that it's going to be total annihilation, mm -hmm. it'll be completely finished. This could relate to something else, which the Prophet Muhammad uh, alluded to. He said that by my coming, there will be now a period of goodness which will last for approximately 1,000 years. We're in the final millennium. After that, it will, the whole story will be wrapped up for humankind. That will be the end. There will be no more prophets sent until the last one comes who will give the last warning and then that will be it. Nobody will listen to him and then everything will be brought to an end. Whether humankind will be completely destroyed or not, that only Allah knows. But it will definitely be the end of the Islamic dispensation as we know it today. So that will be uh, uh, something different. But that's, that's like the, the spiritual end, if you wish. So our Armageddon, our vision of Armageddon is not really a physical destruction as uh, is understood in many other faiths. Or Hollywood. Or Hollywood, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, we're not in uh, Hollywood, I don't think, at the moment, and we certainly aren't seeing any kind of Armageddon in the studio today. However, we have reached the end of time for the program today. It uh, just falls upon me to thank you all very much for your very detailed and scholarly answers, and to thank you at home for your questions. Without you, this program wouldn't be the program that it is. Just as a reminder for those of you still unfamiliar with how to send in your questions if you do have any on what you've heard today or indeed questions of your own. Email faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters at mta.tv. Once again, Jazakumullah from all of us here in the MTA studios in London. Assalamu alaikum.